the labor principle may be found in the familiar and universally admitted phenomenon that even those goods in which exchange value entirely corresponds with the labor cost do not show this correspondence at every moment. By the fluctuations of supply and demand, their exchange value is put somewhat, ab sometimes above, sometimes below the level of corresponding to the amount of labor incorporated in them. The amount of labor only indicates the point toward which exchange value guarantees uh, gravitates, not any fixed point of value. This exception to the socialist adherence of the labor principle seemed to me to make too light of they mention indeed it indeed, but they treat it as a little transitory irregularity, the existence of which does not interfere with the great law of exchange value, but it is undeniable that these irregularities are just so many cases where exchange value is regulated by other determinants that the amount of labor costs they might at all events have suggested the inquiry whether there is not perhaps a more universal principle of exchange value to which might be traceable not only the regular formations of value but also the those formations which from the standpoint of the labor theory appear to be irregular but we should look in vain for any such inquiry among the theorists of this school in fact this fourth exception is absolutely devoid of substance unless one adopts the la latter Austrian pose of radical epistemological skepticism towards the notion of equilibrium price. And if, as Bowen Barwork said, Ricardo himself admitted the existence of that exception, it can only be deduced that Ricardo did not view it as a fatal flaw in the labor theory. It would seem to follow that Bowen Barwork and Ricardo differed in their opinions of the significance of the phenomenon in which case Bohm Barwerk's real task would be to show why Ricardo was mistaken in his views of what can constitute an adequate theory. The labor theory of Ricardo did not just implicitly assume such fluctuation, but depended on it. It was only the process of comp competition over time and the response of suppliers and consumers to the fluctuating market price that continually caused equilibrium price to gravitate around labor value, and Marx said as much explicitly as we shall see below. Ricardo, for the most part, treated value and price as synonymous, and claimed only that value approximated embodied labor over a period of time. Marx, on the other hand, used value in a sense much closer to equilib equilibrium price. Both then asserted no more than the equilibrium price of a good in elastic supply approximates its labor value. And for both, price fluctuations under the influence of supply and demand were the very mechanism by which the law of value operated. Finally, Bohm Barwerk pointed a fifth exception to those cases in which price constantly diverged from labor value and that not inconsiderably to the extent that their product, product, production required the greater advance of previous labor. If he was referring here to a moratization cost of past capital outlays that pre presents no problem at all for the labor theory given its use of capital as accumulated past labor. If he was referring to the problem presented, the labor theory of value by capitalists, capitals of different organic composition and general rate of profit, an at-length study of that issue is beyond our scope here. Suffice it to say that Ricardo, as well as Marx, recognized differing capital compositions as a distorting factor. And Marx saw the general rate of profit only as redistributing surplus value and thus rendering the operation of law of value indirect. And from the mutualist point of view, profit and interest are monopoly returns on capital resulting from state intervention intervention in the marketplace. So for mutualism, the rate of profit expecting 
or accepting the relatively minor part of net profit resulting from time preference with which we deal in Chapter 3. is simply another example of distortions by which unequal exchange causes a deviation from normal values. Bowen Barwork summed up all the deviations from the labor principle and concluded that labor theory of value does not hold at all in the case of a very considerable proportion of goods. In the case of the others, does not hold always and never holds exactly. These are the facts of experience with which the value theorists have to reckon. Bowen Barwork's straw man carcature of what the labor theory was intended to demonstrate certainly did not hold up at all well under his onslaught. But then, straw men are deliberately constructed to be knocked down. He would have made as much sense in saying that the law of gravity was invalidated by all the exceptions presented by air resistance, wind, obstacle, wind obstacles, human effort, and so forth. The force operates at all times, but its operation is always qualified by the action of secondary forces. But it is clear in the case of gravity, which is the first order phenomenon, and which are second order deviations from it. Ricardo's distinction between reproducible and non-reproducible goods, true enough, was misleading. Although goods whose supply is absolutely limited relative to demand are relatively minor portion of all commodities. It is nevertheless true that even reproducible goods take a greater or lesser period of time for supply to accommodate demand. At any given time, the price of most commodities is probably greater or less than labor value. As a result of imbalance between supply and demand, it is only over time that price approximate, approximates labor value. So rather than stressing the quantitative insignificance of scarcity, deviations from the cost, Ricardo would have been more accurate to emphasize the character of such deviations as secondary phenomenon in the overall process by which equilibrium price approximates labor, val labor value. But the Austrians were guilty of their own ambiguity. Although Menger and Bohm Barwerk regarded the influence of production cost as virtually irrelevant in all cases of scarcity, they were unclear exactly what they meant by scarcity. Menger distinguished economic goods, which were characterized by scarcity from non-economic goods. The difference between economic and non-economic goods is ultimately founded on a difference. In the relationships in, rela in the relationship between requirement for and available quantities of these goods, of non-economic goods, he wrote. The relationship responsible for the non-economic character of goods consists in requirements for goods being smaller than their available quantities. quantities. Thus, there are always portions of the whole supply of non-economic goods that are related to no human need. Hence, no satisfaction depends on our control of any one of the units of a good having non-economic character. The problem, though, is that goods are almost never non-economic, in this sense of having no exchange value, whatever, unless an unlimited supply of a good is located at its point of consumption and requires no effort to appropriate it will acquire some value from the effort necessary to transport it to the final user in usable form, even when a village is surrounded by forests with no limit on the amount that may be cut by an individual household. Firewood has an exchange value, even in cooking, cooking or big rock candy mountain. One must mis make the effort of picking the roast chickens off the brush or dipping the whiskey from the stream. Menger, disciple Bohm Barwerk, likewise made scarcity relative to demand the basis of value. Economic value required scarcity as well as usefulness. Not absolute scarcity, but scarcity relative to demands for a particular class of goods. To put it more exactly, goods acquire value when the whole uh, available stock of them is not sufficient to cover the wants depending on them for satisfaction or when the stock would not be sufficient without these particular goods. And the scarcity, as Bohm Barwerk put it, was scarcity of 
present goods. Now it can be shown, and with this we come to the goal of our long inquiry, inquiry that the supply of present goods must be numerically less than the demand. The supply, even in the richest nation, is limited by the amount of people's wealth at the moment. The, dema the demand, on the other hand, is practically infinite. This concept of scarcity is used by Menger and Baum Barwerk has three problems. First, as we have already suggested above, making scarcity and utility depend on balance of demand present and present goods at the present moment. It ignores the dynamic factor in taking the balance of supply and demand in a particular market at a particular time as a snapshot and deriving value from utility. In this context, it ignores the effects of short-term price of on the future behavior of market actors, the very mechanism through which price is made to approximate cost over time. Second, it confuses two kinds of scarcity. One, the kind of scarcity that makes economic, good, economic goods, i.e. a difficulty of production or, or appropriation sufficient to require some effort or disutility to acquire them in a usable form, and Two, the kind of scarcity in which a good is more or less inelastic supply, so that it cannot be produced in quantities proportional to effort. In a sense, the former kind is set up in opposition to a straw man. And we said above, there are virtually no non-economic goods. And, there, and third, the claim that demand is virtually infinite relative to supply is misleading. Demand is not an independent variable, independent variable, but depends on the price of, at which goods are available to be reproducible. In the Ricardian sense, a good need not be reproducible without limit in any quantities an individual might conceivably be willing to consume of it. If it costs nothing, it has only to be reproduced in quantities for which there is effective demand at the cost of production. And as we pointed out above, regardless of the degree of elasticity, so long as supply can eventually be adapted to demand, the equilibrium price will approximate the cost of production.